Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the fifth annual Power of Giving Symposium, bringing historic perspectives to contemporary conversations about educational equity and the role of philanthropy. I'm Anthea Hartig, the Elizabeth McMillan Director of the National Museum of American History of your Smithsonian Institution. It's an honor to be your host for this symposium. I'd like to first acknowledge that the Smithsonian is on the native lands shared by the Piscataway, the Palmonkey, and the Natchachunk, and their descendants are with us today. Wherever we're viewing this, let us acknowledge and give our respect and gratitude to native peoples for the opportunity to work and live in their territories. We have certainly inherited an uneven landscape of educational opportunity. These inequities have always been present in the educational sphere from early childhood to the university level and are now magnified by the multiple pandemics faced by our health, social and economic systems. Today and on Thursday, November 12th, the Power of Giving Symposium will provide a forum for discussing the complex history of the United States educational philanthropy, the historic moment in which we find ourselves and successful philanthropic partnerships that are helping increase educational access. Over two days, philanthropy and education thought leaders will join Smithsonian historians to discuss the role that philanthropy has played in addressing educational inequality and its foundational roots. They will ask, what impact have our recent crises had on existing educational inequities? And what opportunities do they present for philanthropy to address them? And importantly, how can history inform today's philanthropists? The Power of Giving is part of the National Museum of American History's Philanthropy Initiative, dedicated to exploring the breadth and diversity of Americans' visions and experiences in philanthropy. The initiative researches, documents, and exhibits materials relating to the history of American giving and convenes conversations like this one about philanthropy's impact across a wide spectrum of issues. Through this symposium, a collecting initiative and a 20 year changing exhibition with annual themes and digital outreach, the Smithsonian's Philanthropy Initiative examines how Americans' gifts of time, expertise and resources continue to shape American history in all its complexity and reflect our nation's ideas and ideals. We also invite you to visit the Philanthropy Initiative exhibit, Who Pays for Education? in the updated Giving in America exhibition. This exhibit, which you can view online or at the museum, presents how Americans have confronted the issues of who gets educated and who pays for education. Featured objects include a mid 19th century portable library, the kind purchased through community donations, objects from women educators like Nanny Helen Burroughs, who founded the National Training School for Women and Girls in 1909 here in Washington, DC, and a roadside fundraising sign from an Oklahoma teacher who made headlines in 2017. Today, we kick off the symposium with a conversation about the power of history with none other than the Smithsonian Secretary, Lonnie G. Bunch, and the museum's David M. Rubenstein Curator of Philanthropy, Dr. Amanda Moniz. They will discuss why historic perspectives are important for understanding today's educational inequalities and the role of philanthropy. Education policy leader, Dr. Linda Darling-Hammond will next give the keynote, confronting educational inequality, the role of philanthropy in, in achieving a just society. Her remarks will focus on the philanthropic opportunities that address inequity in moments of social upheaval and reflect upon the ways that philanthropy has engaged on those issues in the past and how this can inform opportunities for major social and educational change today. Lastly, philanthropist and former teacher Liz Simons will lead a conversation from a funder perspective with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Bob Hughes, the Spencer Foundation's Dr. Nahila Suad Nasir and Dr. Darling Hammond. We thank you for being with us today 
on day one of the 2020 Power of Giving Symposium. The Smithsonian, this museum, and this initiative also rely on philanthropic support. And we'd like to take this moment to thank the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and David M. Rubenstein, whose support has helped us launch the film the Philanthropy Initiative in 2015 and continue it to this day. We also wish to thank the Fidelity Charitable Trustees Initiatives, a grant making program of Fidelity Charitable, Charitable for their support. Now, it's my great privilege to introduce my friend and the 14th Secretary of the Smithsonian Institution, the first historian, the first African American and the first former museum director to hold that post, Lonnie G. Bunch III. Thank you, Anthea. I have dedicated my career to using history and museums as a means of making a more just society. As the son of educators, I have always valued education to build a museum from scratch. I know how important philanthropy is to everything museums do, especially to the Smithsonian, because we wouldn't be here without the generosity of so many people. Needless to say, this year's Power of Giving event is very special to me. This is one of the Smithsonian's signature programs. The Power of Giving helps Americans grapple with our history, contextualize our present, and understand the ways in which philanthropy can affect change. The Race, Community, and Our Shared Future Initiative with Bank of America is a Smithsonian philanthropic partnership with great educational potential. We can make a real impact engaging civil rights leaders and community leaders and the public in an examination of the historic and current dimensions of race. As an institution founded for the increase and diffusion of knowledge, education is central to our mission. Extending that reach and expanding educational equity became more urgent with the advent of COVID. And that's why we've expanded our digital educational access on our Learning Lab website and across the Smithsonian. We also know that socioeconomic status often determines educational outcomes. Millions of underserved students lack digital learning tools and internet access. Low and no tech learning materials must be part of the solution. So with the USA Today, we created a free 40 page summer road trip activity guide that went out to over 75,000 K through eight learners in June. Smithsonian educators are collaborating with the Washington DC public school system. Learn with the Smithsonian DC provides students with real world, hands-on programs online and in person. And it's a model of what we wanna do nationwide. Earlier this year, I launched a fundraising initiative based on a simple premise. The Smithsonian is for everybody. It's what I've known since my first visit here on a family trip in the mid 1960s. Driving through the South, we couldn't stop at Civil War battlefields or at museums of the Civil War that I desperately wanted to see. I didn't understand segregation, but my parents did, and they knew we couldn't stop. But driving back to our home in New Jersey, they pulled into Washington so we could stop at the Smithsonian. And there, in front of what was then the Museum of History and Technology, my dad explained that here's a place you could come, learn about your past, learn about yourself, and you won't be turned away because of your race. To me, it was a powerful lesson. And that's who we are as the Smithsonian. We are an institution that teaches, an institution that remembers, an institution that inspires, and an institution for all. Thank you so much for letting me be a part of this important program. Thank you, Secretary Bunch. Now, please welcome Dr. Amanda B. Moniz, the museum's David M. Rubenstein Curator in Philanthropy, in conversation with the Secretary about the power of history in understanding educational inequality today. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you, Dr. Hardig, for that welcome. And thank you, Secretary, for being with me today to explore the history of educational inequality in the United States and the role that philanthropy has played in either exacerbating or tackling inequities. You're an educator, your parents were teachers, and education has long been a priority in your family. But African Americans have had to struggle against laws, customs, and inequities limiting their access to schooling. I'd like to begin by talking about your grandfather, Lonnie Doc Bunch, who attended college at night after long days sharecropping and began the family tradition of attending college. Could you tell us the story of his pursuit of education? Doc Bunch, my grandfather, was somebody who was raised as a sharecropper, and he worked for many years on an old Robertson plantation outside of Raleigh, North Carolina. He knew, however, that his hands were made for more than chopping cotton. So he decided that he needed an education, and he found one of the early historically black colleges, Shaw College, and he found that they would let him go to school at night. So it took him 10 years of going at school at night and chopping cotton and picking peanuts during the day. But what he did was he realized that education was the key to the success of the family. And through those 10 years, he recognized not only was it important for him to get a degree, but it pointed him towards a future where he wanted to be a dentist. And what was so moving to me learning about this is that after graduating in 1910, he needed to raise money and he didn't have money to go to, to go to dental school at Howard. So he moved to New Jersey and my grandmother took in laundry in the hotels in Atlantic City and he pushed the rolling cars where they would hire college educated blacks to push um, the elite. And he used that to get money to go to Howard and to become a dentist. And what always amazed me is how one person's efforts could change the trajectory of the family. And that really began my commitment which I didn't even know, commitment to education, commitment to fairness, commitment to recognizing all the possibilities that come with a good education. So Shaw College was founded right after the Civil War by a white union veteran, and like other educational institutions for African Americans after emancipation and in the following decades, the school received support from Northern white donors. But African Americans drove the creation of an educational infrastructure for their communities, and their philanthropy was vital to that project. I wonder if you could talk with us about the role of Black giving in African Americans' quest for education in the decades after the Civil War, including any family stories you may know. You know, what's so clear is that African Americans coming out of enslavement recognized the key to their future was education. It's one of the things they talked about, they demanded. And so while you have white philanthropy that helps to create some of the colleges and some of the high schools, what you have is a commitment from the African-American community to bring its resources to ensure that children or grandchildren have an opportunity that the parents didn't have. And then you see so many black families giving money to their churches, partly because those churches use the money to create schools for their children. So this desire to make sure that education was going to be the way that these communities leveraged and found a way out of racial discrimination was crucially important. And what I'm really struck by in my own family is, I always thought that everybody gave money to colleges and, and to high schools. My parents always did that. And as my father said, this was his way of paying back a place that opened a door for his grandfather, which transformed his life, which ultimately made that four generations of the Bunch family, including my kids, are college graduates. So jumping to the next generation, you've said that your father wanted to be a chemist and that after serving in the army, he went to graduate school on the GI Bill, but racism blocked his uh, path to becoming a scientist. So he became a chemistry teacher instead. Could you reflect on how different institutions either helped or hindered his education and his career as a teacher and likewise your mother's? You know, I think what's so powerful to me are both my parents. Um, they met at Shaw College, 
Um, after the war, after serving in the military, my father loved chemistry, loved science. And all he wanted to be was a chemist. And nobody would hire him in the late 40s, early 50s as a chemist. Um, he got work in some places that were sort of uh, tanneries, but the chemistry got him sick. So in a way, what was clear to me is that he had to find something that would allow him to take care of his, his, or his young family. And he became a teacher. And he talked about how most of the schools in large cities in New Jersey, Newark, Patterson, Passaic, would not hire black teachers. So he had to go to a town that was 40, 40 miles away from where we live that had a very small population, and they took a chance on hiring a teacher. And what was so powerful was he never told me, but his colleagues told me that during the first couple of weeks when he taught in this little town, people would line the streets to see the colored teacher because they didn't believe there could be a colored teacher. And my mother got a job teaching in the town that I grew up in for one year because my mother was very light skinned. They thought she was white. When they found out she was black, she was fired and she had to go find teaching in other places. So for me, I came up in a family that said, you persevere regardless. And I'm curious um, if, as you were growing up and seeing these struggles, if there were conversations about philanthropy or giving, uh, either conversations or examples about philanthropy or giving as a part of the way to, uh, to persevere and overcome uh, these obstacles. The notion was always that you have to give back. And one of the ways was philanthropy. And I remember being told as a very young child to save my pennies and nickels because I thought that was going to allow me to buy a little gift. Instead, when the jar was filled, we'd give it to Shaw College, that my grandmother would make sure that money would go to them. So, so giving has been a long history in my family because we recognize that you can't do it alone and that there are institutions that were fair and you wanted to support those institutions that were fairer to make sure other people got through um, the, the window that you did. And so in my household, what was crucially important was, one, to recognize that your job is to contribute to the greater good. And that means philanthropy. We would do things like, uh, we would do sort of collecting of newspapers and things, and I got to keep half of the money, but the other half went back to colleges that my father thought would be supportive of African Americans. So I've had a long history of making sure that you think not about yourself, but about the next generation. And I know that uh, your dedication to education has shaped uh, you as a learner and educator. Uh, how has your family's history pursuing education in the face of racism shaped you as a fundraiser for educational institutions, most notably the Smithsonian? Well, I think in some ways I learned that you have to raise money to do the greater good. So for me, there wasn't a separation where, oh, I've got to learn how to raise money because it's something that is just expected. Rather, I realized as a young child that part of what you do is raise money to make sure that you open doors for others, that you can contribute, whether it's to the church or whether it's to a variety of funds. I remember my, my father talking about how his mother uh, made him contribute money to freeing the Scottsboro boys, those African-Americans that were accused of race rape in Alabama in the 1930s. So there's a long history of recognizing that giving money, raising money, is really a way to ensure fairness. And so that was always really key to what I wanted to do. The other thing I realized is that I'm um, helping to build the museum. We knew that we had to get philanthropy from a variety of quarters that while we had to sort of make sure that we got money from the corporate community or traditional donors, we had to make sure that this was something that, Afri that the African-American community knew that was a contributing factor to the struggle for fairness, that was a contributing factor to expanding education. And so what that did is allowed us to create a kind of national membership program that brought in millions of dollars giving their five, 10, $15, because people recognize that though they may not have a lot of money, they have a responsibility to contribute to something that will move us towards the greater good. And that was really very exciting and really a key piece of how we were able to build the National Museum of African American History and Culture.
I'm, I'm struck that one of the things you achieved uh, with the creation of the National Museum of African American History and Culture was showing many people in American society uh, the depth and breadth of African American uh, philanthropy. I wonder um, if, as you were doing the fundraising, uh, you had conversations with people about perceptions of African American philanthropy, both what it what it has meant because uh, it has not just meant. Uh, giving money, uh, you know, philanthropy in America in general doesn't just mean giving money, it means giving time, talent, testimony. But in particular, I think for in African American history, uh, examples such as uh, in uh, risking punishment to teach an enslaved person to read is an example of philanthropy. Uh, so I wonder if you could reflect on any conversations you had while you were building uh, the museum on conceptions of philanthropy in the African-American community? I think we had conversations both historic and contemporary. The historic was allowing us to realize that we had to create an opportunity of giving in a variety of ways. Some financial giving, some in-kind giving, allowing educators to help shape our educational program um, as part of their gift to the museum. Um, in some ways, families decided that their gift to the museum was going to be sharing their collections, their objects, their history. Um, but then it was also talking about um, a different moment that occurred during the building of the museum, which was that we now had also a vibrant middle and upper middle class black community um, that really recognized that giving needed to go beyond the traditional. Some of that tradition tends to be the churches. Um, and that the museum became this example of how you can contribute in different ways to help make a country better. And one of the things that I found most moving was the fact that many churches, but especially I always pioneer the Alfred Street Baptist Church in Alexandria, um, actually gave the, mu the museum a million dollars. Um, and so you suddenly realize that we were able to counter the notion that there wasn't a significant philanthropic community of African Americans, that they weren't going to be there to support the museum. And the museum's support, the fact that so much was raised from that community, gave lie to the notion that this was not a community that would give beyond the churches. And that, in essence, what we've learned through our conversations is that anything that could be seen as pushing the country towards fairness giving people opportunities that weren't there, then the African-American community would support that um, with great vigor. Um, I'm wondering if you could reflect a little about um, that notion in relation to the history of African-American philanthropy for education and why the story of African-American funding of African-American education, you know, circling back to your grandfather's story, um, you know, that generation isn't more widely known. You know, we, we we're familiar with um, the major benefactors, but we don't know these everyday stories as well, uh, which in some ways surprises me because most of us are not, you know, major uh, benefactors. Um, and and I, I would think we should be able to relate to these stories. So I just wonder if you could reflect on, on that topic a little. I mean, I, I think you've put your finger on one of the interesting challenges as a historian is that on the one hand, a lot of this was sort of kept closer to the vest in terms of your giving. Um, partly not calling your attention to yourself, um, which could be dangerous at various times throughout our history. Um, but also the sort of mainstream media and, and, edu and newspapers really didn't cover that kind of uh, philanthropy. Um, the fact that millions of African Americans gave nickels and dimes and quarters to help the civil rights movement. Um, find the resources that it needed, um, is a story not, no, not well known. And that in essence, philanthropy has, uh, historians like yourself have done a much better job of helping us understand the diversity of where philanthropy comes from and how different communities define philanthropy in different ways. But I think what is key for me is trying to understand that this community, the African-American community, has always looked towards the greater good which meant what are the ways we can help, especially in terms of education? Because time and time and time again, the one thing you'll hear 
is a desire to help educate other generations. I can remember many times in churches, there would be collections. We want to help this school. We want to help this family get to college. We want to, we want to make sure that we're giving people educational opportunities. So in a way, um, this is really part of a long history that is only now being discovered and unpacked by historians like yourself. And I'm curious, um, since we're uh, addressing an audience that includes a lot of people in philanthropy today, I I'm wondering what lessons you think history offers to philanthropists who are concerned about educational equity and access today? What's clear to us is that there's a lot of data that continues to sort of support the notion that education is the key to fairness and a good life. But it's also a lot that tells us that though so much has changed, education equity is still a goal that's a long way away. I'm struck by the fact that um, amazing um, research done by Stanford um, tells us that a third of school districts um, that have the widest academic disparities between black and white students are near colleges because influent, affluent people in colleges tend to invest a large portion of their wealth in their children's education, but leave out those that aren't related to them. An example of the racism enduring legacy on education is that if you look at places like Charlottesville, Virginia, where white children are four times as likely to be in gifted programs, while black students are more than four times likely to be held back a grade and almost five times as likely to be suspended from school. And that resonates so powerfully to me because I can remember being in junior high and in high school and being told that African-Americans weren't going to get a fair shot. So therefore, don't aspire for college. As one teacher said to me, aspire to handle a broom very well. And so what worries me is when I see statistics of um, black students not having access, I want to make sure that they got through a window that was open for me. Um, and that, in essence, we remember that just because they're in um, integrated schools doesn't mean they're treated fairly like their white counterparts. I, I'm curious, uh, as we have a couple minutes uh, before we wrap up, if you could speak a little bit more about how you see uh, the Smithsonian is addressing these educational challenges. I think your work uh, leading us uh, to expand educational access is very compelling to me as a Smithsonian employee, and I would just love to hear you say a little bit more about it. Obviously, you can tell. As somebody driven by education who worries a great deal about fairness, I think that the challenge in the education system means that everybody's got to find a way to contribute. And I think that means the Smithsonian needed to recognize what an amazing place it is, the amazing resources, the fact that we can help people understand science, art, history, culture, but also what we can do is really provide resources that enrich the educational opportunities for students really ensure ways that we help teachers continue to find mid-career rejuvenation, that we help parents who are now becoming teachers um, use our amazing resources to begin to encourage their kids to learn more and to be made better. So for me, this is a simple opportunity to say the Smithsonian has always been about the increase and diffusion of knowledge. Let us make sure that we're also ensuring that educational opportunities for every child in America ought to be something that we aspire to. And with new technologies, with new commitment, my hope is that we will reach every school, we will be able to give every student access to the wonders of the Smithsonian. And we have just a very brief uh, amount of time left. The Smithsonian is also a leading philanthropic institution and has been since the mid 19th century. What? What is your wish for us as a philanthropic institution and, and an example to the country for philanthropy? What I hope is that the Smithsonian continues to demonstrate that it's worthy of the support that it has received and demonstrate that this is a place that is as much about today and tomorrow as it is about yesterday. And that as an institution, our goal is to make sure that we help a country better understand itself and be made better. 
and by that, we hope to then continue to be worthy of the support we've been given in the past. Thank you very much for talking with me today, Secretary. It is my great pleasure, and thank you for the good work you do. Well, thank you. Thank you, Secretary Bunch and Dr. Moniz. The National Museum of American History is honored to present our keynote speaker, education policy leader, Dr. Linda Darling-Hammond. Dr. Darling-Hammond is one of the country's preeminent educational scholars. She is president and CEO of the Learning Policy Institute, the Charles E. Ducumin Professor of Education Emerita at Stanford University, and president of the California State Board of Education. Being a third generation Californian, I can't tell you how proud we are of all of her work. The title of her talk is Confronting Educational Inequality, the Role of Philanthropy in Achieving a Just Society. Warmest welcomes, Dr. Darling Hammond. I'm delighted to be here today to talk about APU uh, in our society since it was founded and uh, at the front of our consciousness today, confronting educational inequality, the role of philanthropy in achieving a just society. Um, at the moment, we face a public health crisis. We face an economic crisis, a civil rights crisis, and in some parts of the country, also a climate crisis all of which are manifesting in ways that reflect generations of systemic racism and inequality. Uh, and the current realities that we face include yawning equity chasms that threaten major segments of our society and draw attention to systemic racism. We have the largest economic disparity since 1929, right before the crash that led to the Great Depression. Uh, we've had inadequate action at the federal level to address the health and safety and economic effects of the pandemic. Um, and we've seen that schools are one of the few safety nets in many hard hit communities. Uh, of course, the uh, pandemic has been uh, most challenging in communities of color, in low income communities where illness rates, uh, where uh, economic effects, the unemployment that has accompanied the pandemic uh, where um, food insecurity and housing insecurity have been uh, intense. Uh, and schools have stepped up as one of the places that have tried to feed not only the children who qualify for free and reduced price lunch, but also their families, not only for lunchtime, but also for dinner time and weekends, because quite often families are uh, without uh, the wherewithal to even survive in this moment. Uh, but in the places that uh, we see these um, intense effects, uh, we also have school districts with large concentrations of children in poverty, often in highly segregated communities, uh, who are also under-resourced as school districts to even meet these needs. So the extraordinary efforts that are going on across the country uh, are really uh, a manifestation of the layers and layers of inequality that have piled up over the many years um, of our society. The wealthiest 1% of people now hold 10 times more wealth than the bottom 50% of people in the United States. That's been expanding uh, relatively steadily since 1980. And the United States has by far the highest child poverty rate in the industrialized world with close to one in four children living in poverty. It's hot, probably higher now, given the effects of the pandemic and the tattered safety net that we have. Uh, and compared to other countries which provide universal health care, which provide a variety of supports for families and children uh, to offset the effects of poverty, uh, in the United States, the growing level of severe poverty is hardly offset at all. As I noted, this is uh, you know, coupled with the fact that school funding is inequitable across the country. It's unequal across states. It's three times higher in the highest spending states than in the lowest spending states. And it's three or four times greater 
in the highest funding districts as in the lowest spending districts. This happens to be a slide of New York and California, uh, and you can see the great disparities there. Uh, California has since uh, put in place a progressive funding formula that allocates more money for children living in poverty, for English learners, for foster care, children for homeless youth. Uh, New York has not, and New York's uh, approach uh, with regressive spending policies that spend more on the wealthy than on the poor uh, represents that of about 30 other states. Uh, over these last 30 years, poverty has become increasingly concentrated in specific schools and districts, which are also increasingly segregated. We had a big pushback on this uh, set of inequalities in the 60s and 70s, the war on poverty, uh, the Great Society, reduced childhood poverty by more than 50% in the decade of the 60s. Uh, and over the course of time with large federal investments in education, uh, in desegregation, in school, um, investments of a variety of kinds, we saw that the black-white achievement gap narrowed by more than half in reading and by more than a third in math. And had we stayed on course with those investments, we would have eliminated the achievement gap by the year 2000. But in the 1980s, virtually all of those policies were discontinued uh, and replaced by uh, policies that allowed the aggregation of wealth uh, in the hands of the wealthy. Uh, the mantra during that decade was money doesn't matter. Um, and uh, we've, we saw this growing segregation as well as uh, the growth of uh, disparity in funding. Until today, only 12 states spend at least 10% uh, more on high poverty districts than on low poverty districts. And most states do spend less on children in high poverty districts. Overall, kids in high poverty districts and children of color uh, receive about $1,800 per pupil less on their education. Um, and this is something that's been uh, growing over these last 30 years. In fact, the achievement gap today is 30% higher, greater than it was 30 years ago. And funding levels have been falling for education for a decade in this country. After the, the Great Recession in 2008, state funding you know, declined uh, significantly, local funding also, federal funding did not keep pace, uh, federal education aid programs have shrunk. Uh, and just a year ago, uh, about half the states had finally returned to the level of funding they had in 2007. Uh, others were still trying to claw their way back and now we've seen dramatic decreases again in state revenues for education. Uh, and uh, we are likely to see big drops uh, unless there's federal aid in uh, aid to education overall. And of course, schools serving the lowest income children have been hardest hit while more of these families have also experienced homelessness, food insecurity, and lack of health care, It is really difficult to imagine that the United States has gotten to the point where it has left so many children and so many families uh, literally destitute uh, and clinging to survival. The effects of inequality uh, are pronounced. Uh, the anatomy of inequality really begins with the poverty and segregation that I've described, on which we level in most states unequal school resources. Uh, we have an inequitable distribution then of qualified educators, uh, and that leads to an unequal access to a high quality curriculum. Uh, at the top of that pyramid, uh, then are many dysfunctional schools, particularly uh, the apartheid schools in the communities that I've described. That inequitable distribution of qualified educators uh, also leads to a lot of the practices inside of schools that are problematic. Uh, when people come in, as is the case across the country now with shortages in high need communities uh, without training to teach, uh, many of them staying a very short time and cycling out of the uh, profession, so there's a lot of churn. Uh, what we see at the other end of that is poorly organized instruction. It's often focused on very low level rote learning skills, not the 21st century skills that are needed today. Teachers have too few tools to scaffold learning. 
uh, or to respond to student needs. Uh, that often leads to exclusionary discipline when teachers uh, lack tools, they throw kids out of class uh, when the child puts his head down on the desk or uh, responds in a way that the teacher does not know how to manage or redirect. Uh, it also means that we end up with more tracking of students because there's an inability to teach heterogeneous classes, which requires more skill to be able to differentiate instruction around a rich curriculum for everyone. Uh, and there's also a failure to understand students' social, emotional, and academic needs uh, without the background to understand what's going on when you see different behaviors from students. In this country, we have an extraordinary level of ongoing discrimination and prejudice that was rooted uh, from the time when enslaved people were denied access uh, to reading uh, to the, through the era of uh, segregated schools uh, and equitably resourced schools, uh, but we still have this high level of implicit bias, uh, which leads many people in all walks of life, but certainly also in education, to assume that students are incapable, uh, to assume that families don't care and will not support their children. It reinforces harsh discriminatory treatment we see the disproportionate uh, exclusion of uh, African-American, Latinx students, uh, students with disabilities from schools, uh, often for minor offenses that are treated differently with other students. And then that activates social identity threat and stereotype threat for students. Uh, whenever you have an identity that is stigmatized in society, uh, students carry that anxiety and that sense of threat that they will not be accurately seen and um, adequately and fairly treated. And that undermines confidence. Uh, it makes it difficult for students to adopt a growth mindset uh, and it impedes their performance. So all of these things are going on. Um, and as we see in this current moment, uh, the uh, pandemic is activating all of these inequalities. Um, Students of color are primed to be left behind, as this headline notes. Uh, the uh, English learners are um, facing inequalities. Uh, the digital divide is a huge part of the problem for accessing learning. And then meanwhile, teaching jobs uh, are being lost as budgets are being cut. This Oakland student really describes it well, um, what many, many students are experiencing. I'm concerned about food, jobs, money, my education. Racism toward Asian Pacific Islander folks is a big concern for us too. I miss being around my friends and I'm feeling really, really depressed, but I can't really tell my family. And this is what so many students are bringing back to school with them at this moment. Uh, a, a variety of needs that are concentrated in uh, some communities and, and educators are trying to figure out how to address those needs. This picture, which went viral in California of two little girls trying to get Wi-Fi outside the Taco Bell, uh, really captures the digital divide challenge that uh, so many states have seen as well. About 30% of uh, families did not have uh, connectivity or digital devices to support kids in their education when the pandemic hit. Many places are trying to address that divide, uh, but it is a manifestation of some of these same concerns. But there's a moment here where things could change. Uh, in moments like this of great social difficulty and upheaval, uh, these are the moments when we can get generational change in how we think about uh, every aspect of our lives. Uh, Michelle Ampong, who is an Atlanta parent, uh, put it this way. She said, reprioritize. This is the time to see if something can be different. To reset the system, we have to take a loss but we can recoup the loss if we actually get kids excited about education and create a more positive space for them to learn. Uh, at the Learning Policy Institute, we created a framework for restarting and reinventing school, really taking up the fact that so much has in fact changed, that we've made enormous progress in a short period of time, that people are inventing solutions to a lot of these equity challenges. Uh, and the question is, can we share them rapidly enough can we take them up? Can we scale them to create a different system than the one that we inherited from the early 1920s? Uh, 
uh, when we created the warehouse factory model schools that still uh, design the master schedules that we experience uh, that were designed to minimize relationships as students cycle through you know, eight classes a day uh, without an adult knowing them well. They were designed to prioritize rules and regulations. Max Weber was developing the idea of a bureaucracy at that time. And he said, the bureaucracy is perfected to the extent that it is dehumanized. It was an explicit effort to replace um, you know, the one room rural schoolhouse uh, with rules and regulations that would quote, treat everyone the same. But there was also the idea that we were streaming kids to different roles in life. Uh, the eugenics movement had given rise to the kind of testing systems that we now have and that we had then, which labeled some students as worthy of a knowledge curriculum and others as on a menial path to vocational jobs, uh, differentiated, uh, tracked and created um, lanes of inequality in our school systems that are now being challenged in a variety of ways. So if we were to think about what we should carry forward at the, uh, into a new system, not to return to normal, but to return to a reinvented system, uh, we would take the uh, opportunity to close the digital divide in places like California. We've probably closed it already in the last six months by about two thirds. And we are on a path to uh, continue that. We could have done it over the last 20 years and chose not to, uh, but uh, those moments are in front of us. We can strengthen distance and blended learning. We know a lot about what actually works and we're learning more. Uh, innovators are creating effective strategies that should translate back into classrooms so that uh, technology is a part of learning for everyone. And the uh, students who previously had no access to that aspect of society and the economy uh, will now become proficient if we continue to share what we're learning. We need to assess what students need, both in terms of their welfare, their social emotional uh, context and needs, as well as academically. And we see uh, all across the country, uh, districts stepping up to infuse supports for social and emotional learning that were um, not in place uh, before the pandemic. Uh, we see schools redesigning for stronger relationships, in part because we have to get to cohorts that are safe um, in this moment uh, when we have to protect people from transmission of the virus. But uh, we also know that schools that have already redesigned with smaller teams of teachers and kids working together over long period, periods of time uh, and with outreach to families uh, have been more successful. This is a moment when we can return to that kind of a design for relationships rather than to the impersonal warehouse factory model schools that have been so unsuccessful. Uh, it's a moment where there's a lot of uh, emphasis on uh, making learning meaningful, authentic. Uh, kids are engaging when they can make what they're doing connect to their lives uh, and culturally responsive. And there are districts and states that are uh, really organizing curriculum that supports both learning to standards and learning in ways that are meaningful, authentic, uh, and connected to students' experiences. Uh, I think about the UCLA Community School where students uh, use that period of time in their project-based learning context to study the effects of the pandemic in their community, uh, using mathematics to understand the exponential curves, using biology to understand the virus itself, using history and social studies and sociology to understand how people were being affected. Uh, and then carrying that knowledge in ways that could be actually be responsive to creating uh, better solutions uh, in their own schools and in their own communities. Providing expanded learning time, beginning with preschool and giving, uh, closing the equity gap by starting where uh, students are uh, from, from birth on, and especially uh, in the three and four year old years that we know make such a difference in starting with a level playing field, but also using the time in the summer, acceleration academies during the breaks, uh, intensive tutoring that we know to be effective, 
so that students can learn equitably. Uh, community schools with wraparound supports are now front and center on the table because they are able to be sure that families and kids get what they need in ways that are conducive to solving their problems rather than putting them into a bureaucratic morass, um, preparing educators uh, and involving them in reinventing schools is going on all across the country. Uh, extraordinary creativity is uh, underway. And some states are actually looking to leverage more adequate and equitable funding now, even though they have little money, just as California did back in the last recession, so that when money comes back in, it will be spent in more equitable ways. Uh, there's evidence, of course, that money does make a difference. Over the last 40 years, uh, the researchers like Rucker Johnson and Carabo Jackson uh, found that those young people who experienced the benefits of school finance reforms uh, had graduation rates 20 plus points higher, uh, more uh, attainment, higher incomes, and close the poverty gap as adults. <clears throat> we can see how this happened in North Carolina when they made huge investments in equalizing funding in the early uh, 1990s. Uh, went from 48th in the country in math achievement to above the national average within a decade, uh, not only by equalizing access to funding, but also to qualified teachers by investing in teacher preparation and mentoring and professional development, a national board certification, uh, and uplifting the quality of teaching across the entire state. New Jersey is uh, the case in point that I want to point to recently. Uh, after 30 years of litigation starting in 1968, uh, there were nine separate court decisions calling for funding equalization. Uh, I student taught in Camden, New Jersey, which did indeed spend less than half of what New Brunswick was spending at that time. There were no books in the book room when I went to start teaching uh, English to uh, the students who uh, were, had uh, failed the year before and were in summer school. Uh, the state resisted equalization for decades. And you might recognize this uh, line of discourse uh, that was explained by the state commissioner in 1976 in arguing for not investing the resources uh, in cities that at that time were predominantly African-American. He said, urban children, even after years of remediation will not be able to perform in school as well as their suburban counterparts. We are just being honest. And that uh, way of thinking you know, continues to justify inequality in the minds of some in our work today. But New Jersey finally, in 1998, created parity, parity funding, bringing the low spending districts up to the level of the higher spending districts. They invested in teacher and leader learning. They ensured high quality preschool for three and four year olds. They focused their curriculum and assessments on thinking skills. Uh, they required whole school reform model, models focused on child development, like the Comer model. They supported bilingual education. Uh, and uh, achievement, again, like in North Carolina, grew rapidly over the decade, uh, narrowing of the gaps that existed by 2007. Uh, the average uh, Black and Latino student in New Jersey outscored the average student in California, which was at that time disinvesting in education. And now in what we might call a majority minority state, a state that is 53% students of color, uh, New Jersey is second in the nation in graduation rate, right behind Iowa. It's first in eighth grade writing and second in eighth grade reading and math uh, and excelling uh, in a variety of ways. So there is a way to get to equity. Um, nobody's there entirely yet, uh, but the anatomy of equity, uh, which we need to keep in front of us is the support that children need for food, housing, healthcare, preschool and academic support uh, with equitable school resources layered on that, with well-prepared and well-supported educators in every school, uh, with a 21st century curriculum and assessment system that points our system, at meaningful learning for all students, not for a uh, privileged few, uh, and effective and innovative schools. We see this in a number of other countries that have made these investments, 
in a purposeful way over the last several decades. And uh, we have a moment now, we are at an inflection point where we can once again uh, make progress uh, in that direction. So what is the role of philanthropy in achieving a just society? I think one thing is that we need a philanthropy to move from popcorn reform where there are lots of little innovations that are always being started and flying off into the ether. Uh, they start, they stop, they come, they go. And we've got to get to a place where we're scaling up uh, for a lasting investment that really builds something uh, that will stay. Uh, we do, of course, see that in some uh, aspects of philanthropy. Um, I'm going to suggest three roles for philanthropy in this area. Uh, one is to think the unthinkable uh, and then act on it and stay the course. Uh, there was you know, a moment when, uh, when abolitionists were uh, fighting and fighting and fighting for the end of slavery, uh, when uh, after uh, that occurred, uh, there were no schools in the South, much less schools for black students. Uh, when after there were schools, there were only segregated schools. Uh, and this image of uh, a desegregated classroom was uh, unthinkable. Uh, but there were philanthropists at each step along the way, and there have been since, who have said we can think about what it would take to actually achieve complete equity and then act on it and stay the course. None of this happens quickly. Uh, so a three-year cycle with a continual refreshment of strategy does not get us to um, the kind of investment and strat strategic uh, collaboration that's needed to move a society. A second role for philanthropy is building institutions and capacity. And I think about the Southern Education Foundation, which uh, you know, was uh, originally started as the Peabody Fund, George Peabody, um, who was uh, a Northern philanthropist, uh, John Slater, who was uh, a textile manufacturer who created the Slater Fund, uh, contributed and came together. Anna Jeans, who was a wealthy uh, Philadelphia Quaker, uh, created the Jeans Fund. Uh, and ultimately, uh, one of the uh, expert teachers that was trained by the Jeans Fund, Virginia Randolph, an African-American woman who uh, lived her life creating schools uh, and developing teachers and school leaders uh, was the genesis of the Randolph Fund. All of these came together to create the Southern Education Foundation and uh, individually and collectively as they worked together, uh, they began schools for black students. They began high schools when there were none for black students. They founded and contributed to historically black colleges and universities all across the South. Uh, they created teacher training programs. They created teacher leadership programs. They created principal training programs. Uh, all of these came together to build uh, an institutional capacity to do the kind of education that would otherwise not have been done and on which others could then build the next steps towards equity. Uh, and then the role of philanthropy in achieving a just society can leverage equitable policy. Uh, right now, we see the acute need for school finance reforms, uh, for ongoing desegregation efforts, for the expansion of preschool in ways that become universal, uh, to transform and ensure educator preparation. Because at the end of the day, uh, students cannot learn unless their teachers and school principals and leaders uh, understand how they learn, understand the cultural connections that are a foundation for that learning, uh, understand how to create the settings for safety and belonging and the pedagogy for higher order thinking skills. And then community schools, which provide those wraparounds that right now are so essential to being able to survive uh, as well as to succeed. These are not the only areas, but they're foundational. Um, and uh, in the way of unsolicited advice, I'd suggest that there are a number of ways to get there. Uh, it's important to build on and create knowledge, to be solid 
in what one decides to work on and then how one decides to work on it so that we benefit from the knowledge that's come before and we produce knowledge for others about what we've done and what can be scaled up from that effort. Be collaborative. We need a movement to get to an equitable and just society. Be steady, invest over time until the job is done. Um, I sat on for a while the Wallace Foundation Board, which has been one of the few foundations working on developing strong, uh, high quality leadership and leadership preparation in the country. And there was a moment in time where they were thinking of uh, leaving that domain and going off to another one. And um, our conversation in the board meeting was, wait a minute, we've gotten this to the 30 yard line. How are we gonna get it over the goal? Uh, and I'm happy that the foundation has stayed in that area uh, and uh, expanded it so that it has become uh, a linchpin uh, for uh, transforming leadership preparation across the country. Uh, be clear-eyed about what really matters. Um, there's always, you know, the silver bullet. There's always the shiny, um, the shiny object. But what does uh, what is really going to make a difference? And then be systemic. Work on the fundamentals. If you're planting a program, if you're building an existence proof, think about what will it take for others to know about this, to think about this, to scale it up so that it's available to everyone rather than one of the many innovations that we have that are available to a few people for a little bit of time uh, and then disappears, um, often reinforcing the inequalities we have. Uh, and be courageous to tackle the things that matter most. I wanna close with the words of Martin Luther King Jr. Um, uh, around tackling the agenda that matters most. Uh, these are words that he uh, uttered in 1968, shortly before his death. He said, on some positions, cowardice asks the question, is it safe? Expediency asks the question, is it politic? And vanity comes along and asks the question, is it popular? But conscience asks the question, is it right? And there comes a time when one must take a position that is neither safe, nor politic, nor popular, but he must do it because conscience tells him it is right. That's probably the most fundamental role of philanthropy, uh, to be the conscience uh, for all of us, uh, to uh, take the chances that are not safe, nor politic, nor popular, uh, but to do uh, what is right uh, in ways that allow others to build on those actions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Darling Hammond. We will continue to follow these provocative ideas in the next Funder Focus panel. Dr. Darling Hammond will join moderator Liz Simons, chair of the Heising Simons Foundation, Bob Hughes, Director of K-12 Education in the United States, Program of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and Dr. Nahila Suad Nasir, President of the Spencer Foundation. I couldn't be more excited to be with you here today to talk about education philanthropy, one of the most popular causes, but also one of the most polarizing. As an institution, our public education system has been celebrated, maligned, studied, neglected, selectively resourced, and held to account. It's been lifted up by many as an indispensable lever for progress, equity, and social justice, and rejected as such by others. Philanthropy's relationship with our education system has been marked by an ambivalence that reflects these disparate views, with some philanthropists working to make change outside of it, while others work to bolster the system we have. This relationship has become even more complex as COVID, social unrest, and the deepening economic recession have magnified the inequalities already present in the education system and in society as a whole, as Dr. Linda Darling-Hammond referenced in her keynote. 
We're indeed fortunate that Dr. Darling Hammond is joining us along with our other incredible panelists who will share their visions of what impactful education philanthropy can look like. But first, I hope it's okay if I share a bit about my own journey as a philanthropist and why, in the realm of education, I've chosen to focus on early childhood education and care. Long before my husband, Mark, and I started our family foundation in 2007, I was a teacher. Although my master's in credentialing prepared me to be a high school English teacher, I ultimately decided I wanted to work with younger children and use my Spanish. And so my first real job was in a Spanish bilingual combination fifth, sixth grade classroom in Oakland, California in the 1980s. As I look back on that time, I still shake my head at the younger me who had the chutzpah to think she could jump into something like that. I was woefully unprepared for every facet of the work, classroom management, navigating two languages and two grades, connecting with the children's family and the poverty I encountered. It was hard, sometimes daunting work, but I learned on the job and discovered a lot about myself as well as all the things that I wasn't equipped to give these children that I knew they deserved. Fast forward to 2007, when we started the Heising Simons Foundation. My husband wanted to support work in climate and clean energy and I in education. Even though I was no longer teaching, I had never stopped thinking about it and continued to be haunted by those things I hadn't been able to give my students. Things that I was starting to see were, were pieces of much larger systemic problems. There's so many directions we could have taken, but in the end, like many philanthropists, I was guided by my heart as well as where I thought we could really make a difference. A combination of life circumstances and, and dawning knowledge brought me to the world of early childhood education philanthropy. I'd started to think about the importance of those early years in my last year of teaching when I taught second grade. Some of my students had never attended kindergarten and most hadn't gone to preschool. They were eager to learn and came to my classroom with impressive pools of knowledge, but also with significant gaps in their learning gaps that I now know tend to widen over time, particularly in poorly financed schools where all too often children of color are relegated. Then when I had my own children, I was amazed at their natural curiosity about the world, how much they absorbed every moment of every day. And I saw firsthand that early childhood was an incredibly fertile time for learning. And those early years are really the foundation for all that comes next. Finally, it's clear, especially now that the pandemic has brought the early care and education system to the brink of collapse, that the state of our system is inextricably tied to women's empowerment. Because the care and education of young children falls disproportionately on women and they continue to earn less than men, women are the ones leaving their jobs when there are no affordable quality places for their children to be nurtured and educated, thus perpetuating a cycle of dependence, flatter career trajectories and poverty for women. In September, hundreds of thousands of women, nearly eight times more women than men, dropped out of the US labor force and for black and Hispanic women, unemployment rates are now even higher. So I believe that investments in early childhood education and care are much bigger than the small children we think of as beneficiaries. These investments have the power to break vicious cycles and achieve greater equity in society. And I'm proud of our work and I hope that the universe of early childhood philanthropy continues to grow. I should add that in addition to our foundation's work in education and climate and clean energy, we also now fund in fundamental science research and domestic human rights, by which we mean addressing mass incarceration and the criminalization of immigrants. My husband and I have signed the Giving Pledge, and a letter we wrote is on rotation as part of the Smithsonian's Philanthropy Initiative exhibit, Giving in America. I should mention that we're updating our letter in part to reflect our human rights work, which wasn't a major part of our giving when we first wrote it, but seems all the more salient today. So that's a bit about my journey. Now I'd like to return to our panelists and ask them about theirs. So I'm hoping each of you can take a moment to describe your own journey to this work. Who were some of the historic figures, the educators, the social reformers, family members, and philanthropists who inspired you? And what did you, what were some things that you learned about your journey and what are some cautionary tales? So just talk about how you got here and anybody can jump in. Well, I'll jump in. Um, I, I laughed when I, when I first saw the question because I'm not sure that anyone sets out to be in philanthropy, <laughs> but um, so like many, I came to this work um, accidentally, but um, from a broader lens, for me, this work is just another way of doing my life's work, which is about 
making education more just and equitable from K-12 to higher ed. It's what I did as a faculty member and scholar of race and education. It's what I did as a vice chancellor of equity and inclusion. And it's what my core mission and focus is now at Spencer. Um, I deeply believe education should be a means to the full development of the unique potential of each and every one of us. And that there's no greater or more sacred work to be doing than supporting human learning and thriving through education. And um, so I'm inspired by many, many, um, some folks on this call. Um, I'm inspired by many of the historical figures in education, especially the black women in history who were visionaries and warriors for justice and equity. Women like Anna Julia Cooper, Mary McLeod Bethune, who saw the deep connection between education, liberation and civic engagement um, I'm inspired by my grandmother who got a master's degree in astronomy in the 1940s, long before women were encouraged in scientific pursuits. She went on to work at the Lawrence Berkeley lab and after her death and her things, we found this picture of her. It's my grandmother who was a tiny little woman in the shortest meter you could imagine, surrounded by men in suits. She was the only woman in the department and still found a way to be fully kind of who, who she was. Um, you know, I, this, this career path has been quite surprising. Um, I never thought I would be leading the Spencer Foundation. Their funding was really important to me as a doctoral student and in my early years as a, as a researcher. In fact, it was a program officer at Spencer when I was a dissertation fellow, Catherine Lacey, who made me feel like I could be a scholar. So I have deep roots at Spencer and a profound respect for the power of research to, um, to change careers to make new kinds of scholarship possible and really just an abiding commitment to the importance of education research in supporting education systems to move towards equity. Uh, well, I'll jump in second. Thanks, Naila. I similarly have a very personal relationship to the work I do every day. When I was a young boy growing up in rural Wisconsin, um, I was largely in a white environment. Ours was one of the few families that sponsored an ABC student, a young African-American man from uh, Cleveland, who had lived in 33 different foster homes and had gotten such a short end of the stick throughout his life. We continued to be part of his life briefly, but it struck me then and it continues to strike me now how unfair the system is that creates systemically those opportunities that deny kids who had every ability, every interest, every human right that I had, but would never see it manifest in the schools that he attended, either in Wisconsin or Cleveland or beyond. So for me, it became very personal. And it's also a little bit, you know, I was raised in a very Catholic family. So my parents were very much uh, the Catholic workers movement, truth be told, and very committed to things like social justice uh, at home. And, and you, you, you showed your faith by doing something about it. So from there, I went to college and then to law school. And during law school, uh, started work uh, with uh, large uh, institutions for the psychiatrically disabled. It was there, honestly, I just fell in love with dysfunctional public organizations. Uh, <laughs> mental health is an extraordinarily challenging uh, area because it's about science and social science. And those, those, those intersections are places where you see both our strengths as a society and our weaknesses as a society. Our, our passion and racial prejudice gets played out in those arenas. And so from there, I, I ultimately got a Skadden Fellowship and worked at first at Advocates for Children of New York. Uh, and then with the Campaign for Fiscal Equity, doing some of the work that Linda mentioned, uh, thinking through school finance and school reform. In New York at the time, the system was having a disparate racial impact. So we were very concerned about Title VI and whether or not we could show that if you were African-American or Latino living in New York City, you got substantially less, sometimes three times less than similarly situated students in the suburbs. And tragically, while we won that case after 10 years of litigation, uh, we still have enormous challenges and we're back in court. And from there went to new visions because I realized the law is part of the answer and we need policy frameworks and constructs that enable good people to do good work, but also you need to get closer to the ground and really kind of walk through classrooms and understand the challenges and strengths that students bring to school every day, the challenges and strengths that teachers bring every day and some of the systematic ways we deny an equal education opportunity to young people. So I had new visions for public schools. I um, was CEO for 16 years and we created a hundred small schools, some charter, but most district. We created a teacher preparation program that was grounded in the clinical experience of teachers working with master teachers in, in challenging environments and schools. 
we built curriculum, we built data systems, we did a variety of things in close partnership with both the New York City Department of Education, but also with the communities we serve. And frankly, when I was at New Visions, one of our key funders was the Gates Foundation. Uh, and lo and behold, uh, when they were looking for a new executive or a new director of K-12, they knocked on my door with some trepidation. I left uh, an organization I love then and now, but uh, I really enjoyed being at the Gates Foundation. What I'm excited about the foundation is we've really made a commitment to, to a couple of things. One is really collaboration and working both in philanthropy and with community groups to better think through solutions. We no longer create solutions in Seattle. We work actively with educators and community members to think about context and the solutions that make most sense for them. We're committed to racial equity. Uh, our goal is to improve the outcomes of black and Latino students, as well as students experiencing poverty to not only succeed in high school, but to succeed in some sort of post-secondary environment. And I think we, we span a gamut of the proven, the uh, innovative, and then the deep infrastructure that needs to be built to enable all young people to learn. So we'll have a lot more to talk about, but I'm thrilled to be here and thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. How about you, Linda? Well, I'm not a philanthropist, but I will say a little about what brought me to this work. Um, I was, I learned when I went off to graduate school many years later that growing up, I was the beneficiary of a lot of federal programs that were part of the investments made in the 1960s. So I benefited from so much of what was going on at that time. Uh, and, you know, engaged in my own way in marching for you know, civil rights and against the Vietnam War and other things in the 60s. And I went off to become a teacher after college, went to Camden, New Jersey. And while I'd got, gotten a good public education, I think myself, I'd never seen the level of disparity that existed in New Jersey, where when I you know, went to the book room, there were no books and where it was really uh, about starving you know, the children who were there. And after a very short stint in teaching, uh, I uh, went off to graduate school to wor worry about policy because I said, this is really, you know, the, the, the uh, inequalities are so striking. And it was because of philanthropy, because of the Rockefeller Foundation and the Ford Foundation that I did my uh, dissertation in school finance reform. They had a fellowship for minority and women scholars that you know uh, funded people's dissertations and that's how I got into that line of work and you know, later met Bob and worked on CFE and other things uh, in that regard. But as I was going into that, I worked at the National Urban Coalition for a while. Uh, I realized that uh, as Bob did, that you, you, can, you can work to fund things more equitably and that's critically important and still needed. But you also have to figure out how to get education to do what it should do. And so I got into, um, you know, continued to do work in teaching, uh, went ultimately into work in teacher education, did work on other areas of policy, in particular educator preparation policy, uh, because you have to couple somehow the resources that are made available with the knowledge base that translates those resources into the right kind of practice um, that is itself also equitable and empowering for kids. Uh, and over the years, I did a lot of work in educator preparation at Columbia, at Stanford, uh, on other issues of school reform and designing schools. Uh, another thing that um, uh, Bob and I share, Naila and I worked on learning policy together and learning theory. How do you get uh, educators to understand what it is to support learning uh, in ways that are um, culturally connected and empowering for the learners. Uh, and then the Learning Policy Institute um, was started in part with um, the encouragement of philanthropy because Susan Sandler from the Sandler Foundation uh, asked me to think about creating a way to, to carry evidence into the policy arena. We have a huge divide between what we know about how people learn, about how organizations function, about what good um, teaching and learning looks like and what policies we make. Uh, and those had gotten to be a, a gaping chasm uh, by the um, time we started Learning Policy Institute in 2015. Uh, and so what we do there is 
not only our own research on these issues, but assemble the research from others, brilliant scholars, uh, like those that uh, Naila funds uh, through the Spencer Foundation and, and is herself, uh, and try to really carry those directly into the conversations with governors, legislators, uh, school board members, uh, and help them because they usually want to do the right thing to figure out what it would mean to develop a policy grounded in the evidence we have and in what we know about how good policy functions. Um, and so um, I've been the beneficiary of thoughtful philanthropy and I appreciate that. Thank you. I should mention that I'm a proud board member of LPI yes. and, uh, and I'm struck by all the connections that, that this group has. So, um, and I should say that everything that you talked about in your answer to this question, I'm hoping I can return to in some subsequent questions. Um, but for now, I'd, I'd like to ask Naila a particular question that came to me after I read a beautiful blog that she posted early on in the pandemic. And she began her blog with this sentence. More drastic change to education systems has occurred in the last week than it has in arguably the last 50 years. What possibilities does this open up for the future of learning, for the reorganization of our institutions, for the centrality of families and family life? And I'm hoping, Naila, that you could talk about some of these possibilities as you see them and, and how philanthropy can leverage them and maybe if you could talk a little more about what you mean in that quote, this reorganization of our institutions and the centrality of family life. What a great question, Liz, thank you. Um, I, I, I think as Linda pointed to in her keynote, this is a really interesting and important moment in education. And you know, there are many reasons to be worried as Linda pointed out, and there are many reasons to be hopeful. I see a few inklings of hope right now. Um, one, education is in the public eye and in the public discourse like I've never seen in my lifetime. And so there's a spotlight and a, um, and a recognition of how important education and schools are. Um, I think as families are home with their students, um, monitoring Zoom and working on lessons, there's a new respect for teaching and teachers, both in terms of just how difficult teaching is and how important it is. Um, I think districts are thinking more than ever about how important it is to close the digital divide. And there've been many kind of district-wide and statewide efforts to do that. There are new kinds of connections between home and families. It is completely clear we cannot do school without family engagement, involvement. Um, and, and I think, you know, as I pointed to in the quote, the proof, we have proof that profound change is possible in a short amount of time if we have the will or the absence of an alternative. <laughs> um, a caution though, because I think while there are some bright spots of really interesting things happening nationally, in most places, we essentially took what we were doing in person with all of its flaws and inequities and moved it online wholesale. And I think that's a real missed opportunity. So I'll say a little more about what I see as the possibilities and how we might leverage them. One deepening connections with families. This could be a moment where schools really come to see parents and families as true partners in their child's education, to see parents as the expert on their child and on their child's learning, to have substantive input into what their children are, the, the content and the, the learning that their children are engaging in. It can also be a time as families are spending the sustained time together to learn more about the valuable socio-emotional support young people are experiencing while at home and thinking about how that might translate into what we could do differently in, in classrooms. It's time to be open to a shift in the nature of the kinds of learning that schools organize for, right? My, my teenage son has developed several independent projects where he's just taking time to learn things he cares about. And I think that, time and space for students to explore topics of their interest to increase the age for own learning, to more deeply connect the content of teaching and learning to community experiences, to family experiences, to the many important events that are happening in the community and the world. And we're also seeing the profound effects of inequality and how differentials in resources meant that when schools went online, some students got laptops to take home teachers who were trained at the technology systems that could pivot to support their learning 
while others just didn't have the resources to make that transition successfully. Some districts could provide the PPE, create the conditions to serve students in person with social distancing, while other districts struggled to do so. And so it's a real time illustration of, of one of the things Linda pointed out in the talk, resources matter to support students learning. And, and I think it's a call to create a better resource and more robust system. So over the past few years, education philanthropy has come under increasing scrutiny and critique. Some philanthropists have argued that we actually are doing too much education philanthropy, which as I said, is a very popular topic in philanthropy. Um, and that maybe we ought to be focusing more directly on addressing inequality, addressing some of these core issues like institutional racism, poverty, the digital divide, um, rather than, than focusing on education. Um, this is a bit of a devil's advocate question because I, I think you're gonna have a great answer for this, but I'm curious and I'm, I'm hoping I can hear from Linda, but all of you, if you wanna jump in, how would you answer that that point, how would you respond when people say, you know, we really need to be moving away from education philanthropy? And I do have one related question from our audience, and, and this speaks to the other issue in education philanthropy, which is we have a lot of disparate opinions on how we should go about it. And this question comes from, not surprisingly, from Washington, DC. The topic of this symposium, the questioner says, is inextricably linked to contentious political debates. How do we move forward on evidence-based practices? And is there any hope for getting these through divided chambers and state houses? So, <laughs> That's a lot. I, I um, know. And you can, you can answer that question any way you want. You can either look to, should we be focusing on this problem now little, in light of everything that's happening? And how do yeah, we do this? The so a little research. beach and then bump, bump it to Bob and, and Naila. <laughs> yeah. um, I, you know, I do think that there are, I mean, we all have to, you know, a Benjamin Mays was a great educator in Atlanta. He was the first African-American member of the school board and desegregated the Atlanta schools. And he used to talk about how every person was born to do a certain thing. And if you don't do that thing, it won't get done. You have to put your bucket down where you are meant to put your bucket down. So. Uh, you know, are there other areas of philanthropy? Yes, there are. Should we be tackling childhood poverty? We should. And I think a lot of this has to do with leveraging the evidence and the policies so that people understand what the problems are and know something about what the solutions can be that are critically important. Should we be dealing with all of these other areas of housing policy that you know, intersects with uh, segregation, yes, we should. So I think each person has to figure out where they're gonna put their bucket down. Uh, but for many people that will be education. Uh, and then the question is what kind of education philanthropy can be most productive? Uh, and, you know, uh, you said earlier on, Liz, that, you know, of course, you know, philanthropy derives in part from one's own personal experience and one's own passions. And that's, quite legitimate. I think it's important for philanthropists to think about uh, within the framework that they're operating, what are the ways that I can do this work that are going to be sustained and uh, potentially accessible and scalable so that many people get the benefit and that the benefits enhance equity, right? Rather than some little thing that just, you know, happens and then goes away. Um, and there are big areas where there's less contention. I mean, certainly anything can be contentious and education is in, inherently political. We wouldn't have had all this inequality for all these years if it wasn't political, right? Who gets educated? How much do they get educated? What are they allowed to do with their education and so on? But if we jump forward to you know, presumption that people are now ready to think about every human being uh, as worthy, um, then the, the kind of philanthropy that can build on what we do know and what is gonna be sustainable um, can be in those areas uh, that I described earlier in part. You know, How do we get to the settings in which um, kids can flourish and be well taken care of, the kinds of school designs, the resources that 
uh, are an, an essential to support those school designs and the capacity of educators to do the right thing, you know, for each and every child. And the on-ramps, the early childhood elements and the off-ramps, the transitions to college and career that will enable, you know, us to close opportunity gaps and get kids on a pathway to life. There are a lot of things that philanthropy may do that um, don't get at those fundamentals, uh, you know, kind of miss, miss the mark of what would actually make a, a real difference and often get into very, very um, political waters. Um, and there, there may be good arguments for some of that, but I think the, the big task is so enormous and uh, obvious that um, we ought to be able to encourage a kind of education philanthropy that is really clearly pointed at moving us towards uh, both an equitable system and a high quality system. You know, if I can just jump in, one of the things that has always struck me, particularly now in COVID, is the criticality of philanthropy to be risk or, or venture capital. And by that, I mean, there are lots of things that government just can't do, particularly in times of polarization, that philanthropy has a little bit of freedom to do. You know, if we do our jobs well, we move towards equity, we move towards what's right, as you uh, rightly uh, mentioned from Dr. King, and we can do that in ways that sometimes uh, politicians and legislatures, even school boards may be hamstrung to do. And so making those investments, particularly now, where we're starting to see through COVID, the enormous innovative role teachers can play in thinking about their roles with young people. As Naila mentioned, the role of parents and community members coming in and sharing some of the burden of addressing the entire need of every child and building on that child's assets because every child has extraordinary assets. The roles of technology that don't replace human connection but can enhance human connection, making what seems to be hard work simple, the basic efficacy of running a school and enabling teachers and adults and others to think hard about, well, how do I really help Bob learn to read um, given that he's three years behind and that's gonna be a struggle. Only humans can really figure that out. The shifts in pathways that exist between high schools and colleges now, technology gives us an opportunity to uh, provide college courses in ways we never could before to young people in Title I schools. How do we do that? How do we connect young people to their futures in ways that are, are visual and real and they can experience them in real time? Uh, you know, all of these things are possible. And so for philanthropy, I think one thing we should be doing is piloting different new innovations and taking risks that government or other stakeholders can't take against what we believe is right. But secondly, look for real opportunities once we've piloted to scale with government, stay at scale with other stakeholders, and ultimately stop if the idea turned out not to work. Too many people stick with ideas that don't work. Be transparent, own that the idea doesn't work, invest in the evaluation, and then be brave enough to kill it and take some of the political risk that actors in the broader sphere can't take. If philanthropy does that and lives into its convictions, I think we can really move forward in ways that are really exciting and catalytic to the broader dollars that are spent on an annual basis by states, the federal government and localities. It, I agree that it's really important to lean into the convictions and those convictions on the part of philanthropy need to be deeply informed by the research base, what, you know, by what we know works and what matters by taking up the most important and most critical issues. And those convictions need to be informed by what communities and families want for their young people. So I think it's sometimes that top-down nature of philanthropy that, that can be problematic, but philanthropy, philanthropy needs to be um, deeply attuned to the right thing in relation to what we know. Naila, I agree, and I just wanna add one thing, which is it also needs to be tempered by patience. The change takes time, and you shouldn't kind of look at early signs and symbols and, and think that your investment isn't going anywhere. Well, you know, maybe it's my Catholic background, but I think a lot about those first people who put the, the stones in for cathedrals weren't quite sure whether they would see the top of the cathedral when they were done, but choose your stones widely, wisely so that you can build on them and others can build on them. And that's why collaboration and philanthropy is so crucial. Well, I think we're getting great answers. Should we actually do this for real? <laughs>
Well, you guys are um, answering my question before I asked it because I was literally going to ask about how do we do what you're talking about? What are some strategies that philanthropists can employ to make sure that they're really capturing that constituent voice, that they're really speaking with the families, with the communities, and not you know, doing philanthropy over them? If you can talk about some of the strategies, that would be really helpful. Sure, one thing I'm excited about is for the first time, we're gonna be making grants directly to students to engage in continuous improvement and examine the problems that they are confronting in their schools. I think one of the lessons we've learned over the course of the summer and uh, uh, with so much student-led demonstration is young people have real convictions, they have real ability and capacity, and we need to tap that capacity if we're gonna ultimately change the educational experience uh, uh, in schools. They are uh, extraordinarily accurate when they judge the effectiveness of their teachers. They're extraordinarily thoughtful in thinking about the systems that affect them every day. And I think they have the real capacity to make a difference as we go forward. Anything more on that from either of you, Linda or Naila? We'll leave that good answer. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's I think that's perfect. I would just add that I think there's also the the the, um, the issue of how we make decisions about grantees and who we're funding. I know at Spencer we are we are we rely on peers to make decisions about what good research is and the research that we should be funding. And I know for other uh, uh, foundations that fund community-based organizations to have other community-based organizations to have community members in on the decision-making process can be critically important. One thing I'd just add to that is that because I spend a lot of time trying to figure out how are we going to get policies over the finish line that will change the system, is that we often need to have collaborations between and among researchers, community-based organizations, civil rights organizations, educator organizations, um, and legislators and, and uh, governors and others, uh, so that we're bringing all of those voices together and sort of arming you know, each other to create both the, the will, the knowledge base, and the strategies to get things done. So I think it's really important that we come out of our silos and that philanthropists help us get out of our silos um, in these relationships that allow us to get more accomplished. That's beautiful. Um, as a philanthropist and someone who's constantly thinking about how to do better philanthropy to accomplish these goals of really funding in a systemic way, um, I want to return to something you said, Linda, in your keynote, you talked about three pillars. You talked about setting up, um, or I guess you talked about thinking about the unthinkable, you know, having high aspirations, building institutions, and leveraging equitable policy. And I'm hoping that you and others um, here today can talk about what does that really look like in philanthropy? And I, I know in the past, you've also talked about litigation. What are some ways that philanthropy can really dig in to these, to these important ideas and ways of accomplishing change? Yeah. Well, you know, every one of the advances that I talked about, um, you know, was supported by philanthropy. So, uh, you know, whether it's you know, changing the way states fund schools, the litigation aspect of it, but also the research about what will work and the research about the strategies and what is working so that you maintain the political will. For example, you know, the New Jersey case that I talked about had a lot of philanthropy to bring the litigation over 30 years with nine decisions. <laughs> That's talking about sticking with something. Uh, but also, uh, you know, when they, you know, created the preschool programs, they had a lot of um, uh, philanthropy, both around the evidence base to do it and then uh, funding some of the model programs to get the, the things going, funding the educator development supporting the research to document what was working and why it should be continued. Um, those kinds of things are all things that uh, build a system, but that philanthropy can really, you know, contribute to. Um, you know, we've talked about the fact that right now, um, you know, the, the need for educator development is very substantial. And we've got a lot of philanthropy right now investing in 
models of teacher preparation like uh, teacher residency programs that are uh, solving multiple problems at once and that states and federal government can pick up in policy and actually make become the norm rather than the exception. For those things to work, you always have to be thinking about what might be the strategy? Uh, how can we get it going? How do we study it to document what's working? And then how do we work with people who can think about how to scale it up? So I think there are lots of pathways in. It's thinking about how to do that work in a way that can make a difference ultimately in the way we do business for everyone. Yeah, I think that's this point about the collective and philanthropy is kind of unique power to convene, to bring people together around a shared mission to help determine like who's in what lane towards that shared activity. I think there's something else too, which I've been pondering quite a bit, which is the power of philanthropy to set a frame and invite people into it. So I think as we think about these issues of inequality, I think quite a bit about how a lot of our work um, to document or disrupt inequality is still rooted in frames that see kids and families as the problem, that see kids and families as something to be fixed. And, and so at another level, philanthropy can invite in frames that actually see families and communities as a key part of the solution and that don't start from a place of deficit, that don't start from a place of what, what's lacking, start from a place of what's possible and what exists and what strengths are that can be built upon. I think that framing piece is really important as shared activity as well. Yeah, and, and if I could, I would just add, you know, the other thing that I think is important, we frequently at the Gates Foundation refer to ourselves as impatient optimists, but I think we have a better, a more important skill set, which is humble learners, though people may disagree with me. I think really listening, being empathetic, uh, learning and adapting from people you're working with and being bold simultaneously is a real skill set. And so trying to kind of balance all those things is crucial. And then just building a little bit, Naila, on something that I think is implicit in what you're saying. As you set the frame, remember the distorting power that you have as a philanthropist and figure out how to compensate for that power. It's really crucial that we include new voices in understanding problems, framing the capacity that we need to solve them, and ultimately working collaboratively over extended periods of time to make that happen. Uh, if we don't do that, we'll just replicate some of the mistakes we've made in the past. There's very little that's tabula rasa in education reform, but there are a lot of lessons we can learn from people who have come before us. And by learning those lessons, I think we can be much more effective going forward. That's such a good point because there is such a amnesia about what has come before and you know, sort of grounding uh, ourselves in the discipline of looking back in history and what was done, how did it turn out, what can we learn from it, how do we carry it forward is um, rare but really important. I'd like to um, take pick that up, pick up that idea of learning from history and also think about one of the reasons that our public schools started in the first place, which was to teach us about what it meant to be American. And also picking up on this idea of engaging youth and families. Um, I wanted to ask a question, maybe end with this question, especially considering that we just had an election on civics education. Um, and I'm wondering if you guys have, have thoughts on this, how should we be teaching civics and history? Um, for example, the 1619 project, which I believe is um, part of the Smithsonian, um, focused on the history of slavery in the United States and its lingering effects and was recently criticized by President Trump. Do you believe that education philanthropy should support programs and curricula despite the prospect of ideological differences? And are there concerning implications in doing so or not doing so? Yeah, I mean, I think we have to be really careful about distinguishing between ideological differences and the um, historical amnesia that we have in this country to not deal in historical fact. So I, I, those things are really, really different. And it's important to recognize that we don't teach full accurate historical fact when it comes to the roots of inequality in this country. And so we have to start there. And then I think the other pieces around, you know, like Sam Weinberg's work at Stanford, thinking about how are young people making sense of the information they're finding online? 
What do they know about what it means to engage um, as voters, as informed citizens? Like all of those pieces are really important. And to some degree, what we've seen, what we've seen recently in this country is um, a willingness to distort and um, not remain deeply committed to the full democratic <laughs> nature of our society. And so I think it's, it, it's, it's evident now more than ever that attending to civic education is really important. And I think just you know starting from historical fact is really important. Uh, I'll, I'll just add on the, uh, uh, certainly agree plus one on, on what Naila has said. Uh, and you, know, you mentioned Liz that of course, civic education was the reason for a public education system in large part was you know, to be sure that there was a way for us to you know, engage people in being part of a democracy. Um, one of my hats is uh, president of the California State Board of Education. We just enacted a state seal of civic engagement, which students can earn and which we hope um, districts will engage in. Um, they can get it on their diploma. Ultimately, it can be part of the uh, accountability system along with our seal of biliteracy. Um, and what we're wanting to accomplish with this is having students be understanding, obviously, you know, the way in which um, governments and communities operate, but also being actively engaged in contributing to the well-being of the community, whether it's the classroom, whether it's the school, whether it's the local community, um, understanding the ways in which we have to learn to live together and be interdependent uh, as a, and then how do we uh, uh, take that up um, in ways that both understand individual freedom and understand the common good and create uh, pathways to that in each of our own lives, um, which will take different forms, but which uh, is part of being an educated person, right? It's part of being a member of society. So seeing that as something that schools ought to be engaging in um, and that philanthropy ought to be contributing to for the well-being of, of the society, I think is very fundamental. Uh, I think it was Jefferson who said, you know, society that would be ignorant and free once what never was and never will be. Um, and this is a key part of literacy for a democratic society and action to be a member of that society. Yeah, I would just say if you're really about equity, you have to be about equity and you have to look at the data and the systems performance clear eyed and understand where we are and where we need to go. I mean, one thing that I've always remembered is back in the 90s and early aughts, uh, many people talked about the, the fact that we were 16th or 17th in the world on OCED uh, tests, but we hadn't disaggregated that data by race. And when you did by race, you saw that white uh, students were in the top three or four countries of the world and black and brown students were in the bottom three or four uh, countries in the world in both math and literacy. So we, if we want to be about equity, it's great to kind of send out the fantastic email when there's tumult in the streets, but then you have to really look at the practices, the systems, the policies, the resources, and really make a commitment to drive forward on that, even though it will be difficult. Uh, it's absolutely essential that we realize the American dream for every student. I want to thank you all for everything that, that we talked about for contributing such um, everything that you know about the work that you've been doing for so long. It's really been an honor to be with you today. And um, I look forward to what comes next in this moment. There's so many places philanthropy can go. I'm really excited to dig in and, um, and continue this work. Thank you. Thanks, Liz. Thank you. Thank you all for this thought provoking conversation and to everyone who spoke to us today. We so appreciate all of you tuning in to the very first day of our virtual Power of Giving Symposium. We hope you'll return Thursday for day two when we have another full day of powerful conversations in store. You'll hear from Steve Case, chairman of the Smithsonian Institution's Board of Regents, who will speak about the importance of building a virtual Smithsonian and his own educational philanthropy. 
Smithsonian Regent David M. Rubenstein will lead a conversation about the role that philanthropy can play at historically Black colleges and universities and community colleges with three esteemed college presidents. Miami Dade College President Emeritus, Dr. Eduardo J. Padron, Morehouse Colleges, Dr. David A. Thomas, and Bennett Colleges, Dr. Suzanne Elise Walsh. We're fortunate that Ebony A. Thomas, who is leading the Bank of America's new $1 billion racial e equality and economic opportunity initiatives will join us for the discussion. We'll close the program with educators' perspectives on equity practices in the face of dual pandemics. Former Secretary of Education, John B. King Jr. will speak with educators about the digital divide, teacher, teacher diversity, and social, emotional, and academic development, or SEAD. The Smithsonian's National Museum of American History empowers people to create a more just and compassionate future by exploring, preserving, and sharing the complexities of our past. We hope that by joining us today, you too have been able to learn and experience content that is meaningful, important, and helpful to you. Thank you so much. <laughs>